Welcome to Electra Online, and for those who found the previous video a little bit hard to follow, here I have another example in a little bit more graphical sense. So we're going to use another radioactive material, which is potassium-40. Um, it is radioactive, it has a half-life of 1.25 billion years, thereabouts, and it can decay in three different ways. One of the ways it can decay is that a beta particle is being ejected from its nucleus, which means that a neutron in its nucleus is, turns into a proton, which means instead of 19 protons, it now has 20 protons, which changes it from potassium into calcium. About 90% of the time when it decays, it decays from potassium into calcium, and so now we have calcium-40. 10% of the time, the potassium decays in a different fashion. It decays by capturing an electron, by actually taking an electron and injecting it into its nucleus. And so that means that one of the uh, protons, instead of being, um, one of the protons will capture the electron instead of ejecting the electron, and it will then turn itself into a neutron, a very unusual situation. It happens about 10% of the time with the radioactive potassium. And so by doing what we call a beta capture, where the beta particle is injected into a proton, turning into a neutron, we now only have 18 protons that are 19 protons, so it changes it into argon. It happens about 10% of the time. And in a very rare, rare occasion, the radioactive potassium could eject a positive electron. That's a positron. That's the antiparticle of an electron. It ejects a positron. It also ejects a neutrino. And that happens in about 0.001% of the time in the decays, and it changes it from potassium to argon as well. So we do know it happens. It's a very rare thing, and we could kind of ignore it because it really doesn't contribute a lot of argon. The vast majority of argon is contributed by beta capture, and the, the vast majority of the calcium production comes from the beta ejection. All right, so graphically what happens? Let's say we find a rock, and it has... All of the potassium has not yet decayed. So when the rock is formed and it has potassium in it, it has 100% of the radioactive potassium in it. But since the half-life is 1.25 billion years old, uh, 1.25 billion years, after 1.25 billion years, half the potassium will have decayed. Since 90% of that decay, it becomes calcium. We have 45% calcium and 5% argon. After another half-life, 2.5 billion years, of the remaining 50%, half of it will decay, so now you only have 25% left. And since 90% turns into calcium and 10% and, uh, turns into argon, you now have 68% calcium and 7% argon. Those are rough numbers. Again, after another half-life, half of the 25 is now gone, and now you only have 12 left for, cal for potassium, 79% calcium, 9% argon. And then after another half-life, uh, half, half of 12 will be gone, you only have 6 left, with 84% calcium and 10% argon. All you have to do is then take the rock, analyze it for its relative abundance of potassium, calcium, and argon, and you'll be able to figure out, based upon this schematic here, well, how old the rock actually is. So we have different techniques that we can use for different rocks, because not all rocks have the same elements in them, radioactive elements, but you can see that we've developed several different techniques to date rocks. And sometimes we can actually cross-date them with more than one technique to get, hopefully, a much more accurate result. So based upon these type of techniques, we have now discovered that our solar system, including the Earth, is about 4.54 billion years old. And so, trying to study the origin of the universe and the origin of our solar system, it's interesting to know how old it is. And based upon those dates, we can then surmise other things other secrets in the knowledge about how we discover the age and the origin of the solar system. And that's how we did it.